China is no longer behind the U.S. in space. In some areas, they're moving faster. The moon is now a strategic territory, and falling behind is not an option. President Trump just ordered NASA to land Americans there by 2028. So what's SpaceX's answer? They're building a stripped-down starship with no heat shield, no flaps, 20 to 30% lighter than the original. Can removing what made Starship revolutionary actually help them win this race? Let's dive right in. 2026 isn't just another year on the space calendar. It's when the geopolitical stakes around lunar access reach a breaking point. China has methodically closed the gap in human spaceflight capability, and in certain areas, speed of execution, rapid iteration on hardware, they're pulling ahead. This isn't speculation, it's what's happening right now. On December 18, 2025, something unusual occurred. Jared Isaac Mann was sworn in as NASA's 15th administrator. Why does this matter? Because Isaac Mann has actually flown to space aboard SpaceX's Dragon capsule. He understands modern commercial systems from the inside. He knows what rapid iteration looks like. And more importantly, he knows that traditional NASA timelines no longer match the competitive environment we're in. That same day, President Trump signed an executive order with a clear directive. Land Americans on the moon by 2028. Not 2030. Not when we're ready. 2028. This creates immediate pressure. NASA's Artemis II mission is scheduled for April 2026. Astronauts will fly around the moon, farther from Earth than anyone has traveled in over 50 years. But Artemis III, the actual landing, is different. That mission depends almost entirely on one company, SpaceX. And here's where the math gets uncomfortable. To make a 2028 lunar landing happen, SpaceX must complete three major milestones with almost no room for failure. First, Starship HLS, the human landing system variant, has to be finished and certified for human flight. Second, orbital refueling must be demonstrated with real cryogenic propellant transferred between two starships in orbit, not just on paper. Third, before any crew steps foot on that vehicle, SpaceX has to land a full-scale uncrewed starship on the lunar surface and prove the system works. The timeline is brutal, but what's worse is the backup plan. Right now, it's unclear how many Starship HLS vehicles are even being built. At minimum, SpaceX needs two, one for the uncrewed test landing and one for the actual Artemis III crewed mission. That's it, two vehicles. If the test lander suffers a hard landing, engine damage, or guidance failure, the entire schedule collapses. There's no third vehicle waiting. There's no margin. Building a Starship HLS isn't like assembling a Falcon 9. From fabrication to final integration, a single HLS takes well over a year. The vehicle is larger, more complex, and requires subsystems that don't exist on standard Starships. If something goes wrong during the test flight, you don't just build another one quickly. You're looking at years of delay, and in a race where China is moving fast, years matter. This is exactly why SpaceX is considering a different approach. Instead of betting everything on a small number of highly complex, fully reusable vehicles, they're exploring a stripped-down variant designed purely for one-way lunar missions. No flaps, no heat shield, no atmospheric re-entry systems, just engines, tanks, guidance hardware, and landing gear. Here's what makes this work. A standard Starship upper stage carries around 18,000 ceramic heat shield tiles. Each tile has to be individually manufactured inspected, installed, and tested. The process is time-consuming and expensive. The aerodynamic flaps, those massive grid fins that control Starship during re-entry, weigh several tons and only function in an atmosphere. The moon has no atmosphere. Those flaps do nothing on a lunar mission except add dead weight. By removing these systems, the vehicle becomes significantly lighter. Current estimates suggest the dry mass could drop from around 120 to 130 tons down to approximately 90 tons, a reduction of 20 to 30%. That might not sound revolutionary, but in orbital mechanics, mass is everything. Starship's upper stage uses six Raptor engines, producing roughly 1,500 to 1,600 tons of thrust. With less mass to accelerate, the super-heavy booster 
can place the vehicle into a higher energy orbit. That directly translates into less propellant needed once you're in space, which means fewer tanker flights required for orbital refueling. Right now, a lunar mission is estimated to need anywhere from 8 to 16 refueling launches. Cutting that number down, even by two or three flights, has massive operational implications. There's also the production timeline. Building a fully featured Starship currently takes around two months under ideal conditions, largely because of heat shield installation, flap integration, and structural reinforcement for atmospheric re-entry. A simplified version could realistically be assembled in about one month. The cost savings are estimated at five to $10 million per vehicle, just from removing the heat shield and flaps alone. And while this version would be expendable, it won't fly back to Earth, that doesn't mean it's wasted. After landing on the moon, the empty tanks could serve as storage, habitats, or even radiation shielding for future missions. Let's put this in perspective. NASA's space launch system is also expendable, and each launch costs approximately $2 billion. That's for a single flight. In that context, spending $20 to $30 million on a simplified Starship to secure critical landing data and operational experience starts to look reasonable you're getting a vehicle that can deliver large payloads to the lunar surface at a fraction of the cost, and you're doing it faster. This isn't about cutting corners, it's about matching the hardware to the mission. If your goal is to land cargo on the moon as quickly and reliably as possible, you don't need a vehicle designed to survive atmospheric re-entry at 27,000 kilometers per hour. You need thrust, guidance, and landing precision. Everything else is unnecessary complexity. While all of this is happening, it's worth looking at the competition. Blue Origin was founded in 2000. SpaceX was founded in 2002. Both companies started around the same time. Blue Origin even had earlier funding stability, backed directly by Jeff Bezos's personal fortune. Yet more than 20 years later, the output gap is staggering. In 2023, SpaceX launched around 95 orbital missions, most of them Falcon 9 flights, many using reused boosters. That single year alone exceeded what most national space agencies accomplish in a decade. In 2024, SpaceX crossed 100 launches in one year. Launches were happening every few days. Some Falcon 9 boosters flew 15 times or more, proving rapid reuse at operational scale. In 2025, that pace has continued. Falcon 9 launches are still occurring multiple times per week, while Starship test flights progress at Starbase. Blue Origin's most active vehicle is New Shepard, a suborbital rocket. It doesn't reach orbit. It doesn't deploy satellites. It doesn't test lunar hardware. A typical New Shepard flight lasts about 10 to 11 minutes total, with only two to three minutes of weightlessness. These are tourism flights designed for publicity, not exploration or infrastructure development. As for New Glenn, Blue Origin's long-promised orbital rocket, progress has been slow and inconsistent. After years of delays, the vehicle has completed only a very limited number of actual launch attempts with no demonstrated stable or frequent launch capability. There's still no regular operational cadence, no proven reusability at scale, and no demonstrated role in lunar missions. So while SpaceX is launching dozens of orbital missions every year, recovering boosters, testing orbital refueling systems, and building a moon lander, Blue Origin's visible activity remains focused on short suborbital tourist flights. The difference isn't just in hardware, it's in operational philosophy, risk tolerance, and speed of execution. The simplified Starship isn't just a technical workaround, it's a strategic response to a compressed timeline and geopolitical pressure. China isn't waiting. NASA's new leadership understands urgency, and SpaceX is doing what it does best, adapting quickly, simplifying where possible, and focusing on what actually needs to work. This is what winning looks like when you're running out of time. SpaceX isn't building the most elegant solution. They're building the one that works within the deadline that matters. A lighter Starship, no heat shield, no flaps, 20 to 30% less mass, gets hardware to the lunar surface faster, cheaper, and with fewer refueling flights. That's not compromise. That's precision. China isn't slowing down. The 2028 deadline isn't moving. And NASA's new leadership understands that traditional timelines are a luxury we no longer have. SpaceX is responding the only way they know how. Strip out what doesn't matter, 
focus on what does and move faster than anyone thought possible. The race to the moon isn't about who has the best technology on paper. It's about who can execute when the pressure is on. And right now, SpaceX is the only company demonstrating that capability at scale. Blue Origin is still flying tourists for 10 minutes. SpaceX is refueling in orbit and building moon landers. So the question isn't whether a simplified Starship is good enough. The question is whether anything else can be ready in time. If you want to stay updated on how this lunar race unfolds, hit that subscribe button for Space Update 24 hours. Drop a comment with your thoughts. Do you think SpaceX can pull off a 2028 landing? And if this breakdown was valuable, share it with someone who needs to understand what's really happening in space right now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. NASA just made a move that caught everyone off guard. While China's planning their lunar touchdown by 2030, Jared Isaacman posted something that basically said, America won't finish second in this race. But here's what's really interesting. SpaceX quietly revealed they've been working on a completely different approach to getting back to the moon, something simpler and potentially much faster than anyone expected. What exactly did they change? And more importantly, could this new strategy actually beat China's timeline? Let's dive right in. Hours after President Trump officially swore in Jared Isaacman as NASA's new administrator, something unprecedented happened. Trump signed an executive order that Isaacman called the most significant national space policy since the Kennedy era. The timing wasn't accidental. This wasn't just paperwork. This was a declaration of intent. The order commits the United States to returning to the moon, establishing permanent presence there, and doing it all before China plants their flag on lunar soil in 2030. But what makes this different from every other space policy announcement we've heard over the past decade? The answer lies in three words Isaac Mann used, relentless focus and never second place. Because buried in this executive order is something that changes everything. A new 2028 deadline for Americans on the moon, and more importantly, a complete willingness to rethink how we get there. The Artemis program started during Trump's first administration with an ambitious 2024 target that everyone knew was impossible. It slipped to 2027 under Biden. Then technical challenges with Starship pushed it even further. But now we're seeing something different. Instead of just moving dates around on a calendar, NASA and SpaceX are actually changing the game plan. Why does this matter? Because for the first time, the timeline isn't dictating the technology. The technology is finally driving.